Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 661, the Friday edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's May 7th, 2021. All right. Ah, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. It's Friday. Friday's editions are a little, little different. They're usually a free-for-all of all the stories of the week. And we give you our life updates. As you guys know, I live full-time out of an RV here in the United States of America. And currently, I'm outside of Allentown, Pennsylvania, in search of a part. I have had a little leak on my differential. And in any other time, any other non-COVID time, it would be easy to call up, get that part uh, shipped in. And uh, you're back on the road. It, it's a real cheap, inexpensive $60 part. Not a big deal, except for it being COVID times. So I've been here at the uh, the garage of a uh, truck repair facility for two days while they're trying to search and find this part because it's COVID times. They said they got a line on one, and maybe I'll be out of here Monday. We shall see. George, what you been up to? Well, I'm a bachelor this week. My wife... Uh... Our daughters flew over uh, to here, and uh, they took as a special fun vacation. They we got a compartment, a sleeper compartment on the auto train, and they headed up on Wednesday. And the idea was uh, to arrive uh, yesterday morning, and then go up and see Susan's mother and have a uh, Mother's Day weekend with all the girls together. Well, uh, the train's supposed to arrive in Washington around 9 o'clock in the morning, and about 7, Susan woke up, and the train wasn't moving. And she checked her iPhone for the weather, and it said she was in Lake City, South Carolina. Uh Uh-oh. And evidently, uh, a chemical, uh, uh, there was a train derailment, and all from these tanker trains with chemicals, and they derailed and spilled, and... And long the short of it, she spent four, they waited 14 hours before they could finally move. And in those 14 hours, all the food, all the water, all the refreshments on the train were gone. The toilets were filled. And they would turn the train off from time to time. And that meant the air conditioning went off. And being in a metal box uh, in May in South Carolina may not be the most uh, enjoyable experience. No, I mean, it, but, as, as far as mass travel, you don't want to be stuck in a plane when things go bad. But you don't want to be stuck in a train either. Well, the thing is, they wouldn't let them off the train. Oh. Now, granted, there's not a lot to do or see in Lake City, South Carolina. But still, uh, well, this is our government in action. <laughs> the one government-operated form of transport probably the worst reputation it has and a bubble yeah but he, it, here here it was lived out but trains are fun i love train travel when it works that's how we got to new york when city it from, works. What, when from, it works. from milford to uh, new york city all the time was to take the train down it was a blast it wasn't amtrak it was you know but it was certainly overseas new york new haven and hartford yeah that's right so oh crazy let's uh get on to some news here oh before we get too far your responsibility as a faithful viewer is to like this program, Facebook and YouTube, share this program with friend and foe, comment. You guys are the best commenters uh, that I've ever seen. I, I may be biased, but you guys are great. And if you have not subscribed to the show yet, please subscribe. You do that by clicking the little red rectangle and then the bell next to it. George, let's move on to some news here. Um, biggest story, it's a COVID story. And we always tease that we have uh, uh, India news. Well, we actually do have India news. And it's it's a devastating story out of India that affects the Anglican Church. Well, we should say we always have corruption stories. And yeah. Kevin, you know, his appetite for those has been worn off after the 10 years or so we've been doing this. But uh, this story actually first appeared on Facebook by members of the clergy. The diocese of, uh, I believe it is uh, South Kerala, which is in the southeast portion of India, held its clergy conference the end of last month. 
And, and, and as if you've been following the Nash international news, India is in the grips of a terrible outbreak of uh, COVID-19. Most dioceses have canceled their synods, their clergy conferences, not the Diocese of South Kerala. It's 350 clergy were directed. They must attend this gathering in Manur, the name of the town, for four days. Well, on Facebook and now in the news, it's been reported that of the 350, 100 came down with COVID, 40 were in the hospital as of the end of last month, two have died. And they've also in trouble because they violated the law, the state laws against assembly. The, the Bishop of South Kerala, who also is the moderator of the Church of South India, basically said, well, you know, nobody's going to tell me what to do. And uh, here, here's the result. Uh, I mean, it's sad. You get to keep these people in your prayers. Um, but as you talked about, India has been absolutely devastated the last three weeks by uh, COVID. Uh, it kind of avoided the first wave. We, you know, we early reported last year, uh, probably in, in April and March, that places like China in India, where there's mass populations and uh, little understanding or uh, access to good health care, that COVID is going to be really bad. But they avoided the first wave, but this third wave has hit them uh, in a tremendously horrible way because they don't have access now to oxygen. Uh, it's all in the black market. Yeah, and if this were the United States and uh, one in three clergy t attending a conference came down with COVID, that would be national news. Mm -hmm. But to put it in perspective, uh, 400 sick, 40 in hospital, uh, the Indian newspapers report there are 200,000, two, actually 233,000 active COVID-19 cases in the state of Car South Carolina alone right now. That's amazing. It's not how many they've had in the last year and a half, two years, but right now, active cases. So this really is taking off in India uh, as we speak. So you can read up more on that story on Anglican.inc. For those people who are new to our show, we are a sister site of uh, Anglican Inc. And we get most of our news from Anglican Inc. like you should too. Uh, we reported last week about a church who has come to an agreement with their bishop, has left the Episcopal Church with the permission of the bishop, not the lawsuit of the bishop, and has successfully moved into an ACNA diocese uh, under Bishop John Guernsey. It was noted yes. in 10 years, this is the first peaceful transition. Yes, our friend Jeff Walton, who's been a guest of, on the, guest of yours, Kevin, a number of times, reported in Juicy Ecumenism, that Christ Church uh has been received into the Diocese of the Mid-Atlantic. And this is the first time that I can think of, and Jeff says it's true, and I, between the three of us, if we can't think of an I example, think this it, must yeah. be it, because yeah. this is the first time that a church has gone directly from the Episcopal Church to the ACNA with its property, with its people, with the blessing, of the Episcopal Bishop without litigation, without this or that. Now, some of these things were supposed to have happened in the Jeffrey, uh, in the Jeffrey Shorey era, and then she stepped in in Virginia and other places, and the lawsuits began. But well, I think we're in a new day, maybe, in a new age. Maybe technically, when Bishop Mark Lawrence gave all those churches the uh, the deed quick to claims. the property, the, the quick claims, quick maybe claims. that was. Uh, in, in a technicality, going from a safe bishop into the ACNA, but in, in in this terms, this is the first time going from a liberal bishop uh, into the ACNA that I can think of. And you need to give credit to the Episcopal yeah. Bishop, Marian yeah. Edgar Buddy, um, because she's essentially breaking with the collectivist mindset that Catherine Jeffrey Shorey established of slash and burn, take no prisoners. Washington Diocese is having financial troubles, uh, and they've uh, basically decided to be grown-ups and adults. Why force people? I think the Akaki case went back; has been going back now twenty years. This is not just a surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, why force people who don't want to be in your church, who you're not supporting, who basically don't want to be with you? Why force them to stay? 
when you don't have a replacement congregation to step in and fill the building if the people leave. So kudos so, to the bishop yeah. there, Marion Buddy. Uh, yeah. I may not agree with her some of her <laughs> political stance, but she was the one who stood, who denounced President Trump after he, President Trump stood in front of St. John's Lafayette Square with a Bible and got involved in the political machinations around that time. But uh, I think this was a smart move for all concerned. Yeah, let's hope so. Uh, ben Kwashi, we reported uh, almost a year ago now that he had colon cancer. He has uh, given an update that uh, he's successfully treated that, and it is in remission. Awesome. If the primates of GAFCON met uh, the end of last month uh, via Zoom or Skype, they met remotely, electronically. Mm -hmm. And they issued a communique, and there wasn't really that much major news except to report that the General Secretary of GAFCON, Ben Kwashi, was with them online and has responded well to chemotherapy. It looks like he's beaten his cancer. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a remarkable thing, and it's really answered prayer. He's a remarkable fellow, a real leader, a man of God, and the Lord seems to have more work for him to do. So thank the Lord that Ben Kwashi seems to overcome his cancer. Uh, Laws were talking about uh, updates. Were there any updates from the uh, GAFCON community? Mm, well, they made talked about what was happening in England, which <laughs> with the AMIE and the nothing. Uh, ha -ha -ha hard really, soil. <laughs> uh, nothing really. Uh, that yeah, I would stay up at night till three a.m. writing a breaking story about. Uh, okay. All right. Well, no, I mean, our next story is all about Europe and all about, you know, the treatment of Christians who want to profess their faith and teach out of the Bible. Uh, for those of you who are viewers from Finland, we apologize. Um, it, it's tough there. But we have a Lutheran um, clergy person and a Finland um, political person who have been charged with a hate crime uh, because they read verses out of Genesis that seem to implicate that having a homosexual sexual relationship would be bad. What's the story, George? Uh, well, the, the Bible is hate literature. Uh, yeah. Along with Mein Kampf and the elders of the Protocol of Zion, uh, the Old Testament Paul's epistles are now hate crime literature. The bishop-elect of the Evangelical Lutheran Missionary Diocese of Finland, which I think you could say is in relationship to the Church of Finland the way the ACNA is to the Episcopal Church. It's the conservative group within Finland. Okay. Their bishop-elect is a <clears throat> prolific author and he's just written about God's plan for human sexuality. And one of the people affiliated with this church is the former Minister of the Interior. She's a woman politician with an unpronounceable Finnish name. So I won't even try that one. And the pamphlet he wrote and the words that she commended were found by a state prosecutor to be hurtful and harmful to those who don't agree with the biblical sexual ethic. Therefore, they're hate crimes. Uh, see, Finland doesn't have the concept of natural inalienable rights the way we have them uh, enumerated in the US Constitution that our rights are God given uh, in Finland they're state given mm -hmm. so free so the state can decide well freedom of religion freedom of expression freedom to be annoyed at people who offend you the state can order how those work uh, whereas in I'm the not, United States that's not possible if I'm not mistaken that the Lutheran Church is also the Church of Finland Yes, it, it's the state church. It's the state church, um, yeah. So here we have the state church officially promulgating uh, doctrines that a state prosecutor finds offensive. Now, we need to say that uh, this is not a government in the sense of national government action. The uh, local, I think it was the local Helsinki magistrate or local, in other words, they have maverick... Uh, judges and prosecutors there who may be trying to make a name for themselves and this poor bishop elect and this woman politician are going through the ringer for being faithful Christians for using a source document for their beliefs and telling people what that source was yeah uh, just uh, 
crazy times. Um, but if it can happen in Finland, it's not too far away from America as far as uh, the cancel culture. The um, you, Because you believe what you believe, and I don't believe what you believe, you're not allowed to work here. You're not allowed to go to school here. You're not allowed to um, do anything except pay your taxes here. Uh, well, well, supposedly, we should have a solid protection against that by our constitution. Um, but as we've seen, you know, Rudy Giuliani, the president's attorney, has the FBI raid his office, take his lawyer's work product, and to be spied on, you know, violating, you know, all of these provisos of the U.S. Constitution. And it doesn't matter because the Justice Department says do it. And they find a placid, uh, pliable judge who signs off on it. And the Constitution only means what uh, those in power want it to mean. It doesn't have well, a meaning apart from politi politics. I, I don't think Giuliani is the greatest example of that. I think Hunter Biden would be the greatest example of the ability to avoid prosecution uh, for crime based on who you know. Well, the, funny, <laughs> the funny thing about the crime that had a team of FBI agents pound on Giuliani's door at 6 a.m. in his apartment in New York City was for allegedly failing to re register as a representative of a foreign government. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> and they came in, which is a nonviolent crime. It's not yeah. like he's a narco trafficker or whatever. And they came in and they had a search warrant to take all electronic devices. And Giuliani said, well, okay, that belongs to me, that belongs to my wife, ex-wife. And the police and the FBI said, now, who do these two hard drives belong to? Well, those are Hunter Biden's hard drive. And the FBI said, we don't want those. No. <laughs> and they left those two hard drives. They took Rudy's word for it, that those were Hunter Biden's. They didn't want those, but they took everything else and are now going through all of his correspondence and all of his communications with his clients, not just Donald Trump, but every client he has. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that violates so many things about the U.S. law. But, hey, the Justice Department wants to do it. They want to make an example of Rudy Giuliani for defending Donald Trump, Yeah, in my opinion. <clears throat> yeah, and, you know, who knows why? They may have a case, but they haven't proven it yet. So we'll, we'll see. It, it's just crazy times. I mean, everything is kind of the opposite. Like anti-racism is actually racism. You know, it, it's 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 racism of, of a different type. Uh, justice is the Justice Department is the injustice department here. I know, know the Justice Department is going to spend eighty-five million dollars to combat white national white Christian nationalism which means they're going to spend $40 million on each of the two white Christian nationalist extremists in the United States. Uh, now, are they doing anything about uh, people slipping <laughs> over the border? You know, not only are Central Americans crossing the border, but they're recording a large number of Iranians, Afghans, Syrians, Iraqis coming across the border. And are they checking these people? You know, where you are in Pennsylvania, Kevin, I still think they have lockdown measures. Um, but are they having these people tested for COVID, telling them to wear masks? No, come on in, have a great time, wow. register to vote. Uh, yeah, I, I'm probably weeks away from, from burning my mask now that I've, I'm 25 days post shot two, but we'll see. It's so crazy. Um, we've reported on the uh, fellowship, no, what's it called? FCE, what, what's that for? What's the Free acronym? Church of England. Sorry, geez. Uh, my apologies. I've not had my full cup of coffee yet. And to top off here, we reported on the Free Church of England uh, at least for the last three or four weeks where they've had some allegedly missing money from a church that w was and assets that were sold um, and shut down. I don't think it was sold. And this has caused a cascading effect within the diocese where we have a separate diocese that wants to leave. We have clergy who resigned and take their churches out. What's the latest update, George? Well, in the last week, we've had the South American Synod of the Free Church of England. They had a special um, meeting of their synod on May 5th. 
and they wrote to us yesterday with the uh, statement from their synod, which we published on Anglican Inc., that they are with great sadness quitting the Free Church of England. And basically the Free Church of England has just lost its entire overseas uh, component. The same week, uh, Peter Sandlin, another friend of this show and of Anglican Inc., he withdrew his church, Emmanuel Church in Wimbledon, uh, from the Free Church of England. Joseph Rosillo, who used to be the bishop in South America, but has runs now leads now a FCE church in Exmouth, I believe, in the west of England. He has withdrawn from the Church of England, and his church in Exmouth has voted to quit as well. Um, these are some real body blows. And there was also a story in a telegraph about an aggrieved older FCE minister who made all sorts of accusations of injustice against the primus, John Fennec. Now, I, I'm not certain that that's a real story other than yeah, a major uh, a, a cranky complaint. old man yeah. complaining, because but the facts are not clear there. But it it's centering around money, about personalities, about doctrine. The FCE was formed just as the Reformed Episcopal Church was to represent the pure evangelical strain of Anglicanism. And John Fennec has basically taken it down the Anglo-Catholic road, which is, for some members of the FCE, is an anathema. That's why their forefathers left the Church of England, because of all the smells and bells. Yeah. Now it's being introduced by their bishop. So, yeah. Allegedly. So, Allegedly. You know, there's an investigation being done. I would withhold more judgment until there's uh, the investigation's been completed, but uh, it, it's it's hard to watch stuff like this happen. Yeah. So, all right, that's the list of five stories I have, George. Anything else we got? Because we're only going well, twenty-two minutes here. One, this you the one sad some... story. Okay. Uh, there's an Episcopal Church priest in the Dominican Republic who is being splashed across the uh, newspapers there. And the Diocese of the Dominican Republic uh, has just released an official statement on this issue. The priest was acute. The, a three-year-old girl was taken to the hospital uh, for bleeding. And she was examined by doctors who found evidence of sexual assault. A psychologist was called in. And she spoke to the young girl who said that her grandfather and her uncle had raped her. And when pressed to identify who the grandfather and the uncle were, she identified the Episcopal priest across the street and hit the priest's son. No physical evidence. You know, we we who live in the era of CSI, Miami, and all this and that, they don't have that in Santo Domingo. Uh, they just had the girl's testimony as interpreted by a psychologist. And the diocese of the Dominican Republic says, look, we don't know what's going on. We're not involved. If whoever perpetrated this crime of rape should be punished to the full extent of Dominican law, but we're not condemning nor condoning, we're not supporting or rejecting this priest. But why this caught my eye, uh, apart from the normal implications of a, a terrible sex crime against a child, was memories of things like the McMartin preschool case out in California mm -hmm. and the case up in Massachusetts uh, where people were jailed. There's one in North Carolina. People were jailed for 10, 20 years on absolutely ludicrous charges. The McMartin preschool case, you know, had psychologists coaching children to remember things that didn't happen. Yes, I was taken into this underground chamber, and there these things were done to me. And of course, there's no basement in the McMartin preschool, and and, and the all woman these depositions whose business it was was destroyed. The son was jailed for twenty plus years, yeah. and it was all a fraud. It, it was all a fraud put out by psychologists coaching children. So, please hear me not to say that I disbelieve the child, but because this thing has been so thoroughly botched by the police in the Dominican Republic and only have is a child speaking through a psychologist who the psychologist has now been talking to the child so that the child is in essence the puppet of the psychologist how can justice be done for this child 
And that's the saddest part is, you know, you brought, psychology has many great aspects to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, in terms of the benefit to mankind, it's amazing. However, psychology has very bad components to that. And one of those is false memories. And one of those is uh, the, the coaching of uh, people to uh, not remember what they remembered or uh, to have false memories. And, you know, the Big Martin one is the perfect example. They interviewed hundreds of kids on videotape. The, and if you look hard enough, you can find some of these interviews. And you can actually see the psychologist coaching the child into what uh, making up the, these fantasies uh, of what happened. Um, if you go to the Wikipedia p uh, page for uh, the, the McMartin preschool trial, you, you just read through this and you're like, how does this happen? Well, the innocence of a child has to be believed, you know, and uh, the problem is they're highly susceptible to coaching, highly susceptible to suggestion and um, uh, they, they become twice victims. And I, I hope to God that this little girl doesn't become a victim twice. Yeah. And what is so evil and awful is, you know, I'm reminded back to the Kavanaugh hearings uh, where sexual abuse, rape, date rape are real issues and they can have such destructive consequences on the life of the victim and her family. And then to have people for ideological reasons or po political reasons or financial reasons use these traumas to achieve a, an end uh, that is unjust is just so abhorrent uh, to, to shake down people, to destroy political careers, the Me Too movement. You know, Harvey Weinstein, the uh, Hollywood producer, the evidence was there that he was a sexual predator. Um, but there are other Me Too cases that are just like ludicrous, where the mob is bang uh, to, for the head of somebody, and you know Justice Kavanaugh was an example of it. Uh, in my opinion, I mean, I, I, uh, well, I didn't believe uh, that woman. Uh, I, I've even now forgotten her name. Uh, the psychologist who claimed all these things happened. And it was only through the help of another psychologist that she regained these memories. Oh my! Yeah, yeah. So, hate, hate to come down so hard on psychologists, but it is Friday, and it's a oh, my mother's weekend. psychologist, Kevin. Just go <laughs> all the way. Just go all the way. All right, I have a phone call to take here. I'm going to call this person back after we close out the show. Let's see. I think that's it for Friday. You guys have a great weekend. Thanks for watching. Please like the show, share the show, comment on the show. And if you have not subscribed yet, please do so. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 661 of Anglican Unscripted.